is very enraged about the girlfriend. We had no bodies. We had no evidence to suggest there had been a crime. This would have to have been one of the most brutal, vicious incidents I've ever known about as far as murder goes. Welcome back. In this investigation, speculation arose over loan shark gangs, prostitution and love triangles to name a few. But the truth would prove to be more cruel than any other, and that would be that a husband and father could murder his own family in such a cold and callous way. 31-year-old Susan Park, her three-year-old son Andrew, an 18-month-old daughter, Amy, had been reported missing by Susan's sister-in-law, Nina Park. The two women had remained friends, even though Susan's husband, Nick, had been officially separated from Susan for a month at the time she went missing. How close a relationship did your brother have with his ex-wife and children? He would, uh... He would go back and see the children uh, every week or every other week, but uh, I don't know where. Police visited the Eastwood flat where Susan and the children lived and discovered her husband, Nick Park, there. When asked where his family were, Nick Park said they had gone to visit their uncle in Queensland. He said he planned on joining them the following day. But when they contacted Susan's uncle, he told police he had no knowledge of their whereabouts and in fact hadn't spoken with Susan for about six months. On returning to the flat, Nick Park was gone. Police began canvassing neighbours and one woman said that the last time she had seen Susan was 11 days earlier. She said Susan had mentioned that she and Nick might be getting back together. Nick had left her for another woman, but now, apparently, wanted to make amends. Susan had apparently attempted suicide after learning of Nick's affair. Told that there was another woman involved until uh, the last minute, until about September 96 which was a month before they disappeared. So Susan had no idea that Nick had a, a new no. girlfriend, no. even though he'd been going out with her for some 11 months? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, where that uh, Susan allegedly tried to take her own life in around September last year? Yes. Is that around the same time as she learned that Nick had a new girlfriend? That's about a week after. And at that time, she attempted suicide, I think by drinking very important alcohol, a lot of it at once. And she rang me about half an hour before she attempted. I went over and then rang the emergency because I thought that, um, you know, something would have happened. The Parks had been married for four years after meeting in Brisbane, where Susan worked in her uncle's restaurant. Nick was of Korean descent and Susan Chinese. Nick's mother did not approve of the marriage, believing Susan was not appropriate for her son. Nick's sister, Nina, told police that Susan was very depressed before she disappeared and that she had even confronted Nick's girlfriend in the days previous to her disappearance. It was also revealed that Nick had a serious gambling problem. At the time she disappeared, she was very depressed and uh, she was very enraged, I think, about the girlfriend. Let me in! Because they had a lot of fights between them and she went to see Nick 
uh, where the girlfriend technique was willing to get a Nash build, at least two times as I know. He's my husband! And there was a lot of confrontation. Rex girlfriend might have vengeful motive. That was probably the only person that she ever had fights with. She was the Sydney Casino had recently opened and there were rumours of dangerous loan shark gangs using extreme measures to encourage clients to pay their debts. It was believed that these gangs often kidnapped family members of people who owed them money, either holding them for ransom or using them for prostitution until the debt was paid. Police began to wonder if Susan and the children may have been victims of one of these gangs. Now, fearing for the safety of Susan and her children, police needed to speak urgently with Nick. But when they went to the flat he now shared with his girlfriend, Demi, he was gone. An APB was released and Customs later notified police that Nick was at the airport attempting to leave the country with his girlfriend. Nick still maintained that his family was in Queensland and he said he was returning to Korea to visit a sick relative. His ticket was booked for a return flight 10 days later and with no legal grounds to detain him, police had no choice but to let him go, leaving them with a strong suspicion that Nick was on the run from something. His sister, Nina Park, was re-interviewed children's disappearance, there has been some media speculation in relation to Korean crime gangs in association with their disappearance. Can you think of any reason why a Korean crime gang, if there is such a thing, would have no reason to harm Susan and the children? I'm not for sure there is a gang, but I don't know what scale and where they're based, uh, but if there are larger scale gangs with them, um, with uh, money, uh, lending money, and distortion and that sort of things. Um, I don't know if, if there is any personal reason that why Susan and children would be hurt. If she had been hurt by people, maybe if my brother had uh, borrowed money from, it could be possible. Do you know of any person he owed a large amount of money to? Not personally, because he was very secretive about his debt. As far as I knew, if he was in really bad debt, he would usually um, ask for some money from my mother or myself or other friends. Well, do you know who he gambled with? Was it any one group of people or person in particular? I think most of the time, as far as I know, he was by himself. Are you aware if Susan was ever a prostitute? No. No. Um, she had a debt with her uncle when she came to Australia. She had to pay off more than $20,000. She had worked day and night at the restaurants to pay off their debt. I know that she did pay off. And from my knowledge, she would not work as anything other than legal way to pay, pay off whatever, if she had to pay off her husband's debt. Do you know if that's a common practice? It's not common practice as, as such, happen. as you described, but I know for a fact there is um, people selling people for some purposes of being kidnapped or being um, sold for debt. If such a situation did eventuate with the children being involved in it? Sometimes they do um, involve children and they do kidnap children as well as adults. The, the reason for that is that for monetary return, for the return of the people. Police also visited local Asian brothels in an effort to find Susan, but it was a dead end. Revisiting Susan's flat, police could find no evidence of a struggle or violence. Furniture was packed up in a way that suggested it was ready to be moved, but it appeared that Nick had not returned to the flat since police first questioned him. A check of Susan's bank account showed it had been emptied of $300 on the 24th of October, about a week after Susan had last been seen. And the children's account had also been emptied of $400.
but the withdrawals were made from an Ashfield branch, one that Susan had no reason to visit. The only link police could find to Ashfield was that Nick's girlfriend resided in that suburb. While waiting for CCTV footage requested from the bank, police received a call from Susan's neighbour saying she later recalled Nick discarding a large number of documents from Susan's flat after the time she had gone missing, and she'd found the bag containing the documents still inside a skip on the property. Inside the bag, police found a letter from a car rental company showing Nick had hired a car on the 19th of October, two days after the last time that Susan had been seen. The vehicle was never returned, and when they spoke to the car rental office, the employee recognised a photo of Nick as the person who had hired the car. But strangely, he identified the woman who was with Nick as Susan. Police began to wonder if Nick had moved his family somewhere to safety. The car was eventually found at Sydney Airport, and a forensic search showed no evidence that Susan and the children had been in the car or that any violence had occurred inside the car. It came as no surprise to police that Nick and his girlfriend had not returned to Australia from Korea after 10 days, as he'd said. There were growing concerns that Nick Park could have, in fact, gotten away with murder. But with no bodies and no evidence that a crime had been committed, there was nothing to link Nick Park with the disappearance of his family. The missing persons case grew cold until August 1997. Firefighters were conducting backburning along the edge of Watagan National Park in New South Wales when they came across an old suitcase. The case was still smouldering from the effects of the fire and some of it had been burned away revealing items inside. On closer look, they saw a plastic bag and further investigation revealed a human skull inside the bag. Horrifyingly, the size of the skull indicated it was of a small child. Police were called and a second suitcase was discovered just a few metres away. This one had remained unburnt by the fire. Both cases were carefully placed onto a tarpaulin for further examination. As police removed the contents of the second suitcase, they discovered the remains of an adult female. Her head was also covered in a white plastic shopping bag and her hands and feet had been bound. Attention now returned to the first, smaller suitcase. When neatly folded clothes were removed from the case, police were further shocked to discover a third plastic shopping bag, this one over the head of a second child. Sickened by finding the bodies of two young children inside one suitcase and a female body in another, police soon realised they were looking at a triple murder. A post-mortem of the bodies revealed no signs of trauma, obvious injuries or broken bones, but the plastic bags tied around the head of each of the victims pointed to death by asphyxiation. They were effectively suffocated. Identifying the bodies would prove difficult. Missing person files were examined without success until the search expanded as far as Sydney, where a mother, along with her young son and daughter, had been reported as missing from the city's northern suburbs ten months earlier. Nina Parks was called back to see if she could identify items found with the bodies. As you are aware, last week the body of a female and two children were discovered in the Cessnock area. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you some photographs of items that were found with those, those bodies mm -hmm. and see if you can tell me anything about those items. Can you tell me anything about that? No, so Susan's sweater, 
Uh, it's one of her favorites. She wore it many times when we went out. Um, I have many photos of her wearing this. Do you know if you've seen that particular teddy bear previously? This teddy bear, my mother, Andrew's grandmother, had bought a white teddy bear about this size for Andrew's birth. Well, and lastly, I'll show you a photograph of that earring. I believe I've seen that same earring she wore on the day we went out to shopping. That was about five days before she disappeared. It was Susan, Andrew and Amy. Interpol was called in to help find Nick Park. Two specialist investigators from the Southeast Asian Crime Command were appointed to investigate the possibility of a loan shark gang having been involved in the deaths as a payback for Nick's unpaid gambling debts. But after extensive investigation, there was nothing to indicate that Park had any deep involvement with the gangs. Further investigation of the contents of the clothing and plastic bags in the suitcases that contained the bodies found batch numbers on the plastic bags which identified that they had come from a shop at the Macquarie Shopping Centre. A photograph of Susan was shown to the shop proprietor who recognised her as being a regular customer. This led police to believe that the crime scene had been Susan's flat and the only other person with access to the flat was Nick Park. But more evidence linking Park to the murders would be needed. Hardened tyre tracks found at the National Park were re-examined but did not match the rental car found at the airport. However, this time, when police showed the employee 12 different photos of Asian women, he picked out Nick's girlfriend, Demi, as the woman who had been with him, and not Susan. The CCTV footage from the bank branch in Ashfield also showed that it was the girlfriend who had made the withdrawal from Susan and the children's accounts. Handwriting of the signatures on the bank slips also showed that they were forgeries. What's more, a palm print lifted from the slips proved to belong to Nick Park. It would later be revealed that in the days after his family's disappearance, Nick had sold furniture, pawned items, and had even asked for a refund for money that had been paid in advance for his children's childcare. But the money he raised was just a few thousand dollars, hardly enough to warrant murdering his entire family. So a motive was still missing. As police continued their investigations to gather enough evidence to have Nick extradited from Korea, it would become clear that money was, in fact, the motive. Back when Susan had attempted suicide and was admitted to hospital, she was seen by a psychologist. The psychologist had suggested that Susan focus on taking care of herself and her children and urged her to apply for child support, even facilitating by putting her in contact with a child support agency the agency sent a letter to Nick's Ashfield address, which would have arrived on the 17th of October, and police believe that may have been a catalyst for Nick to confront Susan. While overseas, Nick's contact with his family had been sporadic, but his sister said that he and his girlfriend, Demi, had broken up. To your knowledge, uh, Nick, and his girlfriend still living together or still seeing each other in Korea? Um, from what I heard from my brother, they had broken up a uh, while ago. He rang me on reverse charge in May or early June. At that time, he had started to work in James Rose English School in Bijangbu in Korea. When Korean police checked his last known address, he had left and had gone underground. But perseverance eventually paid off, and exactly one year and seven months after becoming the suspect in his family's murder, 
he was back in Australia, facing the charges, but Nick refused to answer any questions. The purpose of this interview, can you state your full name? My name is Song On Park. Would you agree that uh, early this morning, Detective Woods and I escorted you back from Seoul in the Republic of Korea? Yes. And we arrived back in Australia at about quarter to two this morning? Yes. And we came straight here to the Surrey Hills Police Station? Yes, we did. All right, what I propose to do is ask you some questions in relation to the alleged murder of your wife and your son Andrew Park and your daughter Amy Park. Do you have any objections to answering those questions? Yes, uh, today um, I'm not going to answer any questions today. So is it the case, Mr Park, that at this stage, under legal advice, you don't wish to answer any questions? Yes, this is there anything further at all you wish to say about this matter? While Nick wasn't talking, his ex-girlfriend, who was still in Korea, was happy to tell police what she knew. Femi told us that on the 17th of October, Nick received a letter from the child support agency at the Ashfield unit. Upon opening this letter and seeing that Susan would was applying for ongoing child support for her and the children. Nick became enraged. Demi indicated that Nick went to the Eastwood unit. He rang Demi at about 3 or 4 a.m. on the morning of the 18th of October, where he told Demi that their problems had finished and everything would be OK. Early in the morning, Nick then returned to the Ashfield unit where Demi was waiting for him. The following day, Nick wrote out the withdrawal slips from his wife and children's accounts, and the day after, he hired the car. Police believe the withdrawn money and the money raised by selling and pawning property had been used to purchase the airline tickets and that Nick never intended to return to Australia. Demi was offered immunity from the bank fraud charges if she gave evidence at Nick's trial but was given no immunity should the decision be made to prosecute her for any involvement in the murders. Staying in Korea would have been her safest option, but Demi decided to appear in court. Demi told us that after they'd hired the motor vehicle, they attended the flat at Eastwood that night. Demi stayed in the car while Nick went to the unit. He returned to the car with two suitcases. Nick placed those suitcases into the boot of the vehicle. They then drove to an area north of Sydney. She was unsure of the exact location as to where they stopped, but she described a bushland area with a dirt road. Nick stopped the vehicle and threw the two suitcases into the bush. No charges were laid against Demi, who is now living back in Korea. Her witness account, along with the other evidence, was enough for a jury to find Nick Park guilty of murdering Suzanne, Andrew and Amy. He was sentenced to 26 years behind bars, with a non-parole period of 19 years. This would have to have been one of the most brutal, vicious killings that uh, I can recall. I've seen a uh, person shot dead. I've seen them bashed. But to murder two little children and the mother, I think that's one of the worst incidents I've ever known about as far as murder goes. At the bastard Watson Hill. Perhaps the saddest part of this story is that for 11 years, the bodies of Susan, Andrew and Amy lay in a cardboard box at the Newcastle morgue with no one willing to lay them to rest. Not the husband and father who murdered them, not his Sydney family 
and not the wife's family in China. Instead, it took the remarkable efforts of one of the detectives who solved the case to give the victims the burial they deserved. Detective Inspector Peter Fox can still remember the day Susan Park and her children entered his life when he took a call about bones being found in bushland. When Nick Park's Sydney family and a relative of Susan's in Brisbane were contacted, they refused to pay for a funeral. And in early 2007, Inspector Fox was told that if no action was taken, the bodies were destined for a destitute cremation, three urns in one hole with no headstone. Inspector Fox said, it just seemed such an absolute tragedy, the death of this woman and her kids, and there was no one. So he organised a cremation and kept the urns in a safe in his office while arranging their transport to China. Then he hit another snag. Susan's family did not wish for the ashes to be returned for reasons to do with their faith. Eventually, Inspector Fox and his wife Penny sat in a room at the Nantian Temple as Buddhist monks performed the last service for Susan, Andrew and Amy Park. A homicide victims advocate, Martha Jabour, who had been advising Inspector Fox, also went to the funeral. She said, the hairs on my arm stood up when the Buddhist monk turned to Peter and said, Inspector Fox, it's time for you after 13 years to let them go. Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe for more murder, mystery and mayhem. Until next time.